All right, we're going to go ahead and begin. Who, who all needs a, today's class material? Got one, two over here. All right, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Brinson is running off some copies of that. So when he gets in, we'll get you a copy of today's material. Uh, for Wednesday, who all needs a copy of that? Here's Wednesday's class material. You all need that as well. Anybody else? Here we go. Here you are. So today we are going to be looking at lesson three, part three. That's what should be at the top of your pages. Um, and got some uh, some words at the top. Uh, Jonathan, the Kelsey's need. It's the last one. There, there's the big back part on the, on the printer right now. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> well, I think they're the only ones but that are left. Uh, so there'll be more on the way. One more of these. <laughs> when we get a, when we get some more printed off, we'll update these. If anybody else needs one, we'll get a copy of that as soon as we can, too. It may not be today. All right, we're going to go ahead and jump into our, to our lesson this morning. Uh, we're talking about a, uh, this is part three of the nature of man. We're talking about some more of the errors that surround this, this idea of the nature of man. Uh, we discovered that uh, man is, is made in the image of God. We have discovered that he was created good. We have found out that um, man has free will. And using that free will, we repeatedly chose to not act in our nature that we have been made. We've been made good. We've made in God's image. We act counter to that. And as we discovered the truth about what we see about man, we've also uncovered some errors that are believed around him as well. We've found that uh, there are those that believe that man has no free will, no ability to choose, that man is just an animal, he's just like any other created being, uh, or not even created, but just any other creature that has evolved over time. We looked at some of these. Today we're going to wrap it up looking at this idea of postmodernism. And this concept that has really, I think we'll find, is not a new problem, but it is a concept that has been greatly focused upon in the past 70 years. It's become the predominant way that, that man is, is studied and is understood today. And so to begin the class, uh, Jason, do you care to lead us in a prayer? And then we're going to get into some of these definitions. Lord, our God, you are awesome. We are so thankful for the time you've given us to set aside, to come, to look at your word, to think through um, some essential doctrines of faith. God, that we can understand um, you more clearly. We can understand the mind of the people around us more clearly as well. God, that we will um, look at all these uh, aspects of, of life and that we will consider common thoughts of uh, the world that we're living in now. Uh, help, help us to be equipped to have discussions with other people. Help us to understand where they're coming from. Um, and really try to have a heart of empathy to, to meet people where they are with the gospel so that we can share it with them and then they can be uh, motivated to serve you. Lord, in all that we do, we ask that you'll help us to be closer to you, that we will uh, use our time wisely today that we will be focused entirely on your word and on your will for us. Lord, in all of this, we pray that you will be glorified. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm, I'm burning up. Anybody else? <laughs> um, so I want to highlight something that Jason prayed for. That is the heart of community. And we will come back to this at the end of the class. But I think it's, it's really easy. Uh, in the circles that I run in, the people that I talk to, and probably even in your own lives, it's really easy to hear this, this issue of postmodernism and start painting people and maybe use some of the phrases that we'll talk about in a minute and think in the way that we're going to be describing as people that are just uh, 
Well, just thinking of them in, in unfair ways. We need to remember these are people that God created. We need to remember in all of these areas that we're looking at that we're seeking to know the truth so that we can help lead people to the truth. We're not seeking to gang up or to beat up on anybody because of their, because of their beliefs or because of the, the views that they have that are skewed from, from that truth. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so what I want to do, there's a, a quote at the top of your pages. This comes from the book, Truth and the New Kind of Christian. The, uh, Scott Smith, uh, the book that he wrote, that is, is looking at um, some of the ways that, that you have this sort of, sometimes called the emerging church. There's a recognition that what we're going to be looking at here today is not a strictly people of the world versus people of the church sort of viewpoint. This is how the church is morphing into um, what is going to be predominantly Christianity in our day. It's going to be described in many of the ways that we're going to look at. And, and I hope that what we see is when we, when we read some of these phrases that people use, we might even recognize that we use those phrases too at times. And we need to be cautious to understand that maybe nothing wrong with that catchphrase, maybe nothing wrong with the way that we're speaking but we need to make sure that our thinking is correct behind it, that we understand what we're asking when we say that. So we'll get into that in just a second. Um, you have some uh, you have some verses or some words here that we want to try and define. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to think about those over the past uh, week and a half, I think, since we, we were in this class together. So I would be interested to, to hear what some of your thoughts were on these definitions. The first one we have is modernism. Uh, you may have a, a definition, and we're studying postmodernism. Post obviously means after. So, what was modernism? Anybody come up with an answer for that? I looked up an answer to that. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it said the world has to be fundamentally rethought. Human condition could be healed by new approaches to art and design. Uh, modernism participated in broader processes of religious change in the 20th. So modernism is, is this concept, as you said, that, one, there is an object, objectionable truth, and, and that is, it is able to be found. That is one thing that stands out with modernism. And we see modernism kind of, we'll call it the, the end of, the end of modernism fixed in the 20th century. But modernism actually stretches all the way back to the first, uh, even into the third century BCE, or BC. We're going a huge period of time that I hope we see as predominant view is modernism. Now, what exactly does that word mean, though? It's a focus on rationalism. So what I can see, what I can reason through logically, what I can see with my eyes, what I can touch with my hands. Uh, you might even have sometimes hear a term like empiricism. But modernism was the rise to what is, what, well, I, I don't want to say modern day science, because science has been affected heavily by this next word we're going to look at, but it was the rise of science. Isaac Newton is going to be a modernist. It says, I can understand what I can see. I can understand what I can touch. The apple falling from the tree, landing on the ground. I can study that. And so modernism believes in objectionable truth. There is an answer to every question. It is not subjectionable. But modernism also heavily, because it's based on sight, based on touch, heavily disregards the, <coughs> um, the Sadducees would have been modernists. Do not believe in spiritual, uh, the spirit, in, in, in resurrection and life after death. They would have been a, a key example of modernism. So, postmodernism, after that, what did you all get for that? Anybody have an answer for postmodernism? One of the big things is that objective truth can't be determined. It's just kind of subjective and left up to individual interpretation. What's true for you isn't true for me. And right. That kind of thinking. Yes, and I think that is a, a, such a key thing to understanding what we're talking about is truth and the individual. The individual reigns sovereign over truth. So what may be true for Tim can be true for Tim. But I, as an individual, have sovereignty over my truth. And his truth cannot, they, they can't compete with one another. So postmodernism is a reaction to modernism. People looked at this modernistic 
uh, approach to truth, and they didn't like it. And they began to rebel against it. And you see it popping up in art. That's one of the first places we see it, where you'll go back to uh, Monet and some of these artists that you look at it, and it's, I know the artist was deciding, I'm, I'm painting a bridge. I'm painting a, a, a person, but it is, it is objectionable. We can look at it and say, this is the object. But around the 40s, the 50s, we start seeing the rise of postmodern art that says, it doesn't matter what the artist thought. What do you, as the interpreter of the art, what do you think? That's what it becomes. And you see a great emphasis on that. Nothing wrong with that. But we see that it starts shift, shifting our philosophy as well to think in these ways. It doesn't matter what the creator of things designed. What do I think about it? doesn't even matter if we have a creator. So there's uh, no objective position which to judge truth. You'll hear a lot of discussion, some of we already said, my truth, that's your truth. What we're talking about is perspective. So in a postmodern world, maybe there is this vague kind of cloud of truth, but unless you're standing where I am, you can't see what I see. And what I see kind of going back to, you know, the, the tenets of modernism still play a part in that. What I see is real to me. So, you know, if I'm standing over here and I see Jeff this way, this is the truth for me. And somebody standing over here from this point, there is equally true. And we can't, if we see something different, we, the, the only thing for us to surmise from that is we must both be right. Because we're both seeing it that way. This is the concept of postmodernism. So one that is relatively new to me, I never really thought about it, but there is a pre-modernism. If there's a post-modernism, if there was something after, what came before that? And what you're really going to see here is this belief system that kind of um, shaped, <clears throat> excuse me, shaped and, um, and, and brought about a lot of the literature that we read prior to the first century. This is something that we would see the patriarchs and the kings and much of the Bible written. So what was pre-modernism? Anybody got an answer for that one? Well, I got, uh, I got nervous in thinking that maybe I didn't find the right thing, but uh, truth can be uncovered, understood, it's objective and knowable, so kind of the opposite of pre-modern, or modernism in a lot of ways. So, similar to modernism, but one thing that is super opposite, so yeah, you're, you're on the right track, pre-modernism is, object, truth is objectionable, modernism is, truth is objectionable, we can find an answer to the question. Modernism focused heavily on what we can see, on what we can touch. But pre-modernism recognized that natural and supernatural are both entities and, and are facts and are things that we can use to discover that truth. So Isaac Newton looking at the apple falling from the tree. I keep saying that. It was Isaac Newton, right? I'll get the right guy. <laughs> Isaac Newton falling, seeing the apple falling from the tree. He says, I can see there's a force. Even though I can't see the force, I can see the reaction of it. But at the same time, Paul going, we can't see God, but we can see the, the evidence of God in our lives. We have no reason not to believe in God. The Bible is a pre-modern piece of literature. That's what we're seeing in the Bible. It is something that says there is an objectionable truth. We can discover that truth. But to do that, we're going to have to examine both the natural world and the supernatural world as well. So we're really not going to focus on these two. We're going to focus on postmodernism today. And we're going to look at two different uh, uh, two different words, relativism and deconstructionism, uh, and see, we'll probably spend more time on relativism than anything else, but we're going to see that they're all interrelated. Postmodernism, relativism, and deconstructionism. These terms, specifically relativism, comes from, you, can, you can kind of think one guy. One thing that you might discover as you look into this, maybe Donna, you did some research on it, You'll find a million different answers to the definitions to these words. One guy will say it means this, the next guy will say it means this, which I think is a, is a consequence of postmodernism. This is what I think is true, so it's true. Well, this is what I think is true, so it must be true. But one thing that you find repeated, repeatedly is, the, phrase, or is, the, is the, the person Jacques Derrida. Jacques Derrida is a uh, Slovakian French philosopher, and he... It's not that far separated from our lives. I believe he passed away just in the past 30 years. Um, but this man is the father of deconstructionism. He is the one that, that really brought up this, this idea that says, 
look, we need to disassemble how we view the world, how we make our decisions. We need to break that down because it's fundamentally flawed, and we need to rebuild it based upon these new truths that we've discovered, which are primarily postmodernism and relativism. Relativism being, it depends on, you know, your standpoint. It, 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 let's look at our, our quote up here. Beliefs are validated relative to their specific systems. So relativism is something may be true to you, but it's how does that relate to me? I have, may have a different experience. I may have grew up differently. I may come from a different belief system. I may come from a different culture. And so what's true for you may not necessarily be true for me. And I think there's aspects of that where that makes sense and causes people to latch onto it and say, yeah, this is true because I've seen it. Like in a, uh, in a Muslim culture, there is a, a high regard for certain dietary laws that is very true for them that this is morally wrong when they, when they talk about it. Or it, it at the very least, it is um, socially unacceptable. It's socially unacceptable to live this way, and yet... In, in our society, it is completely acceptable to eat those things, to act that way. And so, relativism, right? It's relative to them. But that's not, and I, I use the word morally wrong. I should have said acceptable, because that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about truth. We're talking about absolutes. We're talking about, is, is there something that is absolutely wrong that would only be true for them and not true for anybody else? And that's what relativism is saying. It's saying, yes. There's something that's absolutely wrong. That's why, um, that's why a, a same-sex couple can say it is absolutely wrong in the Christian faith to have a, a same-sex relationship, but we are not from the Christian faith. And so it is not wrong for us. It is only relative to your, uh, to your specific system or to the practitioners of a certain belief. So these are the ideas that we're going to be looking at. <laughs> I hope that as we use the, you know, kind of talk about these, you start seeing very quickly, like, our world is filled with this. This, is, this makes up the way that the, the largest percentage, and I think there's a point where we say, this is how atheists think, this is how agnostics think, but this has become how Christianity thinks in many ways. This has infiltrated the belief system of, of predominantly the world, and when you talk to people, you talk to your neighbors, and uh, you talk to people who have grown up in a different uh, religion than you, even if it's Christianity-based, and you say, hey, I want to study the Bible. They'll say, well, it's okay. You think what you think. I'll think what I'll think. You have your Bible. I have my Bible. You have your church. I have my church. And what they're saying is it's relative. Your beliefs are relative to you. My beliefs are relative to me. So we, this is this is greatly impact our world. But what I want us to understand is this is not new. Judges 21, 25, even though the Bible is a pre-modern text, Post millennial or post modernism dates back forever. In Judges 21 25, we're reading one of the last lines, in fact, I think the very last line of the book of Judges there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Rightness is relative to me. What was that that we saw when we studied uh, when a priest on Samson? He looks at the woman and says, She is right for me. She was not right for him. The mom and dad know she's not right for him. She's not an Israelite. That's not. That's something that God has said is not to happen. Samson says, "Hey, that's your view. She is right for me in my eyes." This is a this is a huge problem in the book of Judges. It remains a huge problem today. And so, what we're going to do is spend our time kind of looking at some practical problems that arise. There's things that you just maybe have as, as you think about it. There's some things that might come up and just everyday living, not necessarily tied to, to eternity, to our relationship with God, just if we really take this to its logical conclusion, the truth is relative to you. <clears throat> you can decide what's true. Nobody else can tell you what's true but you. What are some practical problems that come up from that? And then we're going to dig in to some, some scriptural problems that are going to help us to show others, look, if, if you believe this is true, the practical problems are helpful for people that don't believe in the Bible. Scriptural problems are helpful to say, all right, if we do believe, if we come to this point where this, this is something that's worthy of modeling our life after, how does this view of postmodernism, how does it fight with, how is it refuted by the Word of God? So, some practical problems that arise from postmodernism. Just what are some of your all's thoughts? I want to think, I want to hear what you all kind of think 
Somebody that's just going around says, you know, truth is completely relative to me. If I believe it, it's true. It doesn't matter if you agree with me or not. What are some problems that might arise from that? I think it blurs the lines of basically everything we know. There is no right or wrong. There is no, I mean, morality goes out the window. And that's, you know, if you have people saying that uh, pedophilia is a sexual orientation, examples like that, you know, yeah. it, um, it, it throws... All bets are off. There are no rules. You do you. Have fun. Yeah. So it completely opens up the uh, the gambit for for anything that you desire and any sort of safeguard, whether it be morally placed upon us by the Creator or even just placed upon us by our governing authorities, go out the window. They are of no no uh, good for us. How many times have you maybe seen a video of someone who's been pulled over for speeding? And the officer says, "I clocked you at such and such with this." With this radar gun that is calibrated and working properly, and it is telling you this is your speed. There's no, there's no question about it. They say, "Well, I don't think I was going that fast, and I'm going to take this to court, and I'm going to fight with you." And, that, and that's the, the whole, the whole subject of the video is them just making a fool of themselves, making life miserable for this police officer because that's not a standard for me. Even though this is truth, that's your truth. Uh, that's a great one. All the all the safeguards that we have that kind of undergird our our life and also keep us safe mean nothing. What's another one? Well, even just things like words lose their meaning because you can use it to attack someone else and be like, well, they said this, but what they really meant was this. Because if it's all relative, then even language becomes relative. Yeah. Yeah, I think of the word love. Tell my wife, I love her. What's that mean? I mean, that is, that is a word that's grounded in truth somewhere. To show a, 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 a sacrificial heart towards, a, an affection for. But in our, in our relativistic world, love just becomes lust. It becomes using. It becomes whatever I can take from you, I enjoy taking that from you. How can we really have any meaning to our words if there is just no objective uh, agreement that this is what this means. It just kind of becomes a flippant use of, and that's what it's become. People just say, I love you, and they just kind of go through their life. They don't really have a love for it. It's just a word that we say. It doesn't have any real substance. Good one. What else? Transmovement. I mean, born a, born a man, but not so much. I, I'm a woman. Yeah. Like, first, but, like you were saying, it's their truth. My truth is and what's wild about the trans movement is, because it, it's not new, this is not a new thing. Uh, in fact, in, uh, in, in first century time, the church was dealing with the trans movement at that point. I think we have a, uh, an ability to look at our world and go, it's never been as bad as it is now. Solomon would say, nothing's new under the sun. We've dealt with this before. First Corinthians chapter 11 starts off with, I have created you as women, and I have created you as men. We need to remember what God has done. Why would Paul need to do that? And then immediately turn around and start talking about women have a certain role, and men have a certain role, and men not to have their hair in a certain way, and women have to have a covering. And we can get all the, all the, the details of that, but what, what's really going on? is people going, I, I think I can do what I want to do, and I want to do what men do, so I, and I want to do what women do. And, when you dig into the culture, you find out Bacchus, Dionysius, these Greek and Roman gods were gods of, we, we would say maybe chaos, but really it's gods of anything goes. You want to be, you're a housewife in Rome and you don't like living as a housewife in Rome. I'm just going to worship, I'm worshiping Bacchus and I'm going to go and act like a man. That was an everyday occurrence. Corinth would have seen that over and over again. The Christians would have walked down the street and seen <laughs> women who were, who, were, who had made themselves up to look like men, and men who had put on wigs and makeup and clothing to make themselves look like women. This is not a new thing. But this is the result of subjective truth. We can be what we want to be because it's my truth. It's a good one. Another one that I think of is, where does our banking institute even go? So if it's my truth, I call up the bank and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out $1,000. I've got something I want to buy over here. And they say, you don't have $1,000 in the bank. Well, that's your truth. That's your truth. Now, my truth, my truth is I have 15 gajillion billion dollars in the bank. How can we have any sort of agreement 
How can we ever get anything done if we can't find something to agree upon that says this is fixed and it's going to dictate how we do business, how we, how we create contracts? I hope that we see that with this postmodern idea, really just, just reality doesn't exist. And, and thus you will sometimes find people that see that and they do take it to the logical conclusion. Reality doesn't exist. Maybe this is all just a simulation. And that leads to some very depressing thoughts as well. The postmodernism argument actually falls apart because if a transgender person sees themselves as a, the opposite sex, then what, what about my truth that I see that they are not the opposite sex? So let's talk about that. They leave it they don't. That is absolutely, that's a great question. And that's, as we go through these practical problems, you'll get those catchphrases. What about my truth? Well, okay, what about your truth? But then let's, let's go and turn. Does your truth supersede my truth? Because that's exactly what they're saying is if you, you, cannot, you cannot mess with my truth. My truth is I'm a girl. Even though I was born a guy, you can't mess with that. Okay, well then what gives you the right to mess with my truth that says you were born a guy, you're a guy. So what are some ways that we might reason through these, these catchphrases? All truth is relative. If somebody telling you that all truth is relative, and, and so you you can't tell me that my truth is is not true, it's only relative to my viewpoint. How much I, how much you answer that? Don't think too hard about these because this is not this is not me suggesting we need to have these arguments with everybody that says this. But what are some ways that you might think through that? What are some ways you might respond? Is that statement relative? Is that statement relative? Absolutely. Is truth only relative to you? If it's only relative to you, guess what? Truth is not relative. It is, it is objectionable, and you are God. And you have set yourself up as that. If truth is only relative to you, then you're the standard bearer of truth. But if it's not, if it's relative to all of us, then you can't tell me I'm wrong. Here's another one. There are no absolutes. Anybody got an answer to that? Sounds pretty excellent. <laughs> are you absolutely sure about that? Can you be positive? This statement, there are no absolutes, is a self-defeating statement because it is an absolute. It is a, a, a question, uh, our question that immediately arises from it is how can we be sure about that? How can you convince me of that? If what you're saying is you can't be convinced, there's no way to convince you of anything if there's no convincing Arguments. Is it true for you, but not for me? Is that statement only true for you? If that statement, and that's what Durham was bringing up, if this is your truth, what about my truth? If this statement is only true for you, again, we have an absolute, we have an objective truth. You're telling us all to, to revolve around that, but you've got to be able to support that. You've got to be able to prove that. That's the thing that God does. It says this is truth. And then spent thousands of years revealing it over and over again. This is true. So, again, this is not, I put these up just kind of humoristically. I want us to see that these arguments are self-defeating. They are not based in reality. And it's very easy to see through that. Having said that, <coughs> if you know somebody that, says, that believes these things, this is not going to win you the argument. This is going to create an enemy. This is going to create some, somebody that doesn't want to talk with you anymore. There may come a point when something like a, a, a phrase like this, someone that says, I believe there's no absolute say, Are you absolutely sure about that? Do you see, do you see the, the difference? There may come a point where we can have that conversation. But if we're on the streets and we're shouting at each other and this is what we're, we're throwing out, we're just throwing mud. We're not leading to truth. And I want to make sure that we don't think that that's what we're going through in this class. But I do hope that we see that these are just completely self-defeating arguments, this whole belief system. I think we do have to be careful about that, Kyle. Because if we think some of these are funny, like to us, like, a, like how in the world can you believe this? You get, sometimes you find yourself getting sarcastic. Yes. A sarcastic Christians are not going to win many souls. Exactly. Um, so the, so it's, it's, uh, it's easy to do because you're like, this belief could be got there. It's already, it's, it's way out of left field. I mean, there's a, I know there's other people who believe that too, but it's just, you get thinking like that, like you said. There is no chance of leading anybody like that to a, to a, to a standard or to a different, to, to a God. So I want you to think about, first of all, Jason, when Jason prayed, he prayed about having an empathetic heart. 
we need to have this heart that is wanting to lead people from truth, from error into truth. I want you to remember also what Ron just said, that when you have the truth, when you know what's real, it's really easy to look at someone and think, that is just foolishness. How can you possibly be this ignorant? And when you think that way, I want you to think about Jesus, who stood in the middle of Jerusalem, not with the, the Pharisees, not with the Sadducees, not with the harlots and the prostitutes and the tax collectors, with his disciples who followed him and were going, we're the greatest, but which one of us is going to actually be the greatest? And Jesus has the truth. And you know he has to be thinking, you guys are ignorant. You do not get it. How many times do I have to teach you the same lesson and you still are so wrong? He doesn't say that. And in fact, when you, we just went through uh, Mark in the library study. Mark 7 through Mark 10 is going to repeatedly bring up the failure of the disciples to, to, to see what is right in front of them, the truth that's in front of them. They are thinking subjectively. They are thinking, we are elite. We are with Jesus. We are number one. And Jesus, instead of just completely cracking them and, and breaking them and mocking them, he <clears throat> saying, hey, let's go to the next city. I'm going to perform a miracle. Maybe you're going to get it when I do that. But he just patiently leads them on. We need to have a patience. We need to see the truth. We need to have a patience and a love for people who think like this to say, I want to, I want to lead you on. I want to keep a relationship with you. I want to show you. We're going to talk about these things. We're not just going to ignore it and say, okay, well, you, you know, you have your truth, I'll have my truth, and we'll someday maybe bring them together. That's not going to work. We have to stand for truth. We need to stand for it in the way that Jesus did. All right. Luke chapter 8, verse 2. Somebody turn over there. Maybe you weren't thinking about this passage as an answer to postmodernism or to relativism. Whoever gets there first, go ahead and read that. And I want us to talk about how this relates, uh, what, what's similar, and, and what hope we might find in this passage. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. All right. Mary Magdalene, seven demons in her, seven demons have come out. How does this relate to relativism, <coughs> postmodernism, and what hope do we find in it? Anybody have a thought on any similarities that we see in this? I want you to think about a school kid. Maybe it's one of your kids. Maybe it's one of your students. How many different directions are they pulled in right now, today, over whether or not they're a male or a female? Mom and dad are saying, you're born a male, you're born a female. Girl in class is saying, I was born a female, but I'm a male. You maybe have some teachers that are saying, you have a safe place to come up to the conclusion that you want to come up with. You have a world that is saying, it is your truth. You be whatever you want to be. You have preachers that are getting up saying, absolutely not. You hold on to the truth and nothing but the truth. They have seven different directions that they're being pulled. Can you imagine Mary with seven demons in her, pulling her to do Every different thing. Can you imagine the torment that she was in? Can you imagine the hopelessness, the fear, the hurt? That's our society. And when you start looking into the effects that this has had on our children, suicide rates have went through the roof. Depression is at an all-time high. We're talking about we're talking about mimicking times of the Great Depression. Times when people just could not find a reason to live. And now we're going, you can be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. And people still are going, I don't know if I want to live in this world. This is Mary. This is Mary's world that we live in. But what's the hope? There was a cure. Jesus was able to take Mary's tormented messed up world and create unity and truth and harmony and peace and joy and someone who had purpose and someone who knew what they were doing and they knew the direction their life needed to go and they 
They were able to fulfill that. They were able to move through that because of the power of Jesus. We need to see that. We need to be teaching that. We need to be telling people, I know that it's that it, you're pulled in a million different directions. I know that you may not even know which direction is true. I know that you may think that this is the only way that you can live life, but I want you to know there's another way. And there is a, there is a power, there is a, a love, there is a God that wants to help you to see that. We need to, we need to learn from we need to learn from this one verse. Man, of all the things that, that Jesus has done, I would love to know more about what Mary's life was like and how that change occurred when Jesus came into her life and changed it. It's such a wonderful passage to think about. Uh, before we go on, I want to share with you a, a humoristic conversation between two philosophers. I don't expect you to remember these names, but I hope you find a little bit of silliness in their conversation. Protagoras and Socrates. Socrates we probably recognize. This conversation is recorded 2,400 years ago. Protagoras is making the argument, this is in a debate, truth is relative, it is only a matter of opinion. That should feel familiar to us. Socrates says, you mean truth is merely subjective opinion. Protagoras says, exactly. What is true for you is true for you. What is true for me is true for me. Truth is subjective. Socrates said, do you really mean that? That my opinion is true by virtue of it simply being my opinion. Which Protagoras says, indeed, I do. Socrates says, my opinion is true. Uh, my opinion is truth is absolute, not opinion. And so you are absolutely in error. Since this is my opinion, you must grant it is true according to your philosophy. To which Protagoras responded, you are right. <laughs> I love I love that that conversation was recorded out of all the meaningless philosophy I love the commitment of Protagoras in that conversation because that is that is what we come down to at the end of this alright let's look at some scriptural problems to this issue and, and then we're going to, um, to really start wrapping class up so I gave you a whole bunch of them on here. Hopefully you had an opportunity to fill in some of those. We're not going to look at all of them, but maybe, uh, maybe you've got some ideas that you could add to it as well. So I'm going to put these verses up here on the board. Um, what are some things that stand out about these? When you read these passages, what are some ways that they describe God? What are some ways that they describe His Word? What are some things that the Bible is revealing about itself and about the God of the Bible? So, for example, we have John 1.17. The law was given through Moses. Grace, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now read that passage. What's, what's trying to be revealed to us? There's a standard. There is a standard, absolutely. There is something that is fixed. What else? Just in that one verse alone. There's some forgiveness in there. There's grace. Absolutely. There is, that while there is a standard, it is not this... Uh, uh, you know, I think we, we sometimes I think of coldness and rigidity. Uh, it, it is not this cold, rigid standard. It may be fixed, but it is, it is allowing of those that are trying to discover it to, to have some, some room where they are growing in that. So there's some forgiveness and love in that. What else? Who is the, who is the bearer of the standard? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is. It is not grace and truth were realized through man. Genesis chapter 3, truth was destroyed by man. We decided we want to be judges of what is good and what is evil. We did a terrible job. We continue to do a terrible job. The very book of Judges reveals we do a terrible job at that. Over and over again, man is not able to prove that what is true, but truth is realized through Jesus Christ. So we're not going to read every single one of these, but what are some things that stand out as you look at these verses? What are some things that you discover the Bible is revealing? I mean, truth can't come from us. I, I mean, as you were saying, like we have to have someone who is outside of our reality to show us what reality is. And I mean, seeing that Jesus is the exact representation of who God is. Um, and just knowing that uh, since 
His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. He understands things at a level that we couldn't even begin to try to comprehend. And so if we're trying to base things off of what seems fair to us, I mean, kind of like John 1, um, like the law was revealed and, and there was a lot of like fairness, equality type things, but that wasn't the full truth. Um, right. We see more about what truth is with Jesus, someone who has the right to show us. Absolutely. We could have, I didn't put it in here, we could have put John 1.18 on this list. That Jesus, the, the very last little, you know, four words of, of John 1.18, he describes him. That's three words. So that those last three words, Jesus describes God. Hebrews chapter 1, he is the express radiant image of God. If Jesus has come to show us what truth is, there is somebody outside of our reality, the Bible is saying. There is someone that is reality. There is a God that is truth. And Jesus is the representation of that. He is the explanation of that to us. Something that the law offered but didn't completely give. In which Jesus, who came and said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. I came to bring this to completion. What else? First Peter 1, we not only... <clears throat> We have well, not only do we have a standard, we have an imperishable living and enduring standard that, that has been through every society and every generation since the creation of man, and that's been the same standard throughout. So, it, so the uh, it's got like I said, we're really really hurts the fact that based on where society is, that's where your opinions flow, and get, well, we, we've always had a standard. Absolutely, that was that that idea that God is truth, and He has been showing that truth since the creation. And it doesn't waver, it doesn't, there's no sh shifting shadow in God. And if you want to make yourself out to be true, if you want to have the audacity to say, I am true, nothing else but me is true, you've got to be able to prove that. You've got to be able to show the consistency in that. And what some people might find is, well, I have a piece of truth. I don't have all of it. God is the complete and enduring truth that, is, that doesn't, doesn't change it won't go away based upon what the world, you know, relative to what the world thinks. Is our clock right? I thought I heard the bell ring out there, but I don't ring. I was say, I haven't heard a bell back here. I haven't heard one. I can still hear when it's off, but it's 10.30. Yeah, yeah it's, that's what I said. It looks like I had like one minute left. All right. Um, over and over again, the Word of God is revealing. We're, we're going to jump through some of these really quickly. It's revealing that it, that it is true, that God is true, that Jesus is the ex example of truth. There's a few, a few quotes I want to read to you real quick. John MacArthur on his book, The Truth War, said, Truth is never determined by looking at God's word and asking, what does this mean to me? This is how some of these languages have shifted into the church, into, the, uh, into Christianity. He says, whenever I hear someone talking like that, I'm inclined to ask, well, what did the Bible mean before you existed? What did that mean 50 years ago? The question is, what does this mean to God? What is God trying to say? These are the proper questions to ask. Um, R.C. Sproul says, we do not have any right to look at a biblical text from the perspective of 21st century and change its meaning. If the perspective of the 21st century doesn't fit, think of relativism, it's all about perspective. If the perspective doesn't fit with the Bible, the perspective is what is wrong not the Bible. We need to make sure that we approach God's words in these ways. And while, I, and I've said it, Ryder, Ryder came through the house the other day, he had his suit buttoned up, he had it buttoned from top to bottom, every button on that suit was buttoned, and I said, buddy, it's just the top button, man. I said, you're going to look so much better. He goes, I like it this way. I said, you do you. And as he walked around, I'm like, oh, why did I say that? I can't believe I said that. So, it's, it's not the catchphrases that are the problem. It's the philosophy that's behind them. When this philosophy starts coming into our Bible, it's not the problem that we ask somebody, hey, what does this mean to you? Make sure we understand what we're asking. What do you think this means? Is a lot different than what have you made this to me? I want to know what you all think a Bible passage means. But we have to understand this because I think it means this doesn't mean that that's really what it means. We want to dig down into it and go, does my thinking match up with the truth of God? If not, it's me that needs to change. I need to mold myself in humility to that. So, a couple things we didn't get to. I wish we could have. First Kings 18, um, when uh, Ahab, when Ahab sees uh, Elijah, and he says, you troubler of Israel. Why is he the troubler of Israel? Because he's preaching truth to him. 
When the king that's not mentioned in 1 Kings 22 and then King Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel, king of Judah, are preparing to go to war, Jehoshaphat says, is there not a, a prophet of the Lord that we can question? What does the king of, of uh, Judah say? Because there he is, or no, the king of Israel. He says, there he is. He never says anything that I like. I don't want to use him. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, they will find teachers that will scratch their ears and they will heap them up. This is not a new problem, but this is the, this is the reflection of postmodernism and the danger of it. Psalm 12, this is David praying that this would happen. He says, Lord, cut off flattering lips, lips of people who say our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? If I'm the holder of truth, I am coming to the conclusion I am God. And I have the right to tell people what I want to tell. I have the right to believe what I want to believe. Romans 2, 6 through 8, God will render to each person according to his deed. But it says specifically in verse 8, those who do not obey the truth, wrath and indignation. There is danger here. We need to see this, but we must never get, forget 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. That's where I wanted to end. We must never forget that. We are to do it without quarreling. We are to do it with kindness and gentleness, and we are to do it with truth as well. Guys, thank you all so much for your comments.